My name is uh, Jesper, and I've handpicked myself for this specific session on the on the track. That's uh, the benefit of being the track host. You don't need to consult anyone else. Uh, I've been working with uh, Lean and Agile for the last 10 years in possibly every thinkable context, uh, every thinkable role, product owner, mentor, scrum master, developer, whatever you want to call it, in uh, everything from small startup with uh, five people just want some process to get their product to market, to big corporate organizations with uh, a thousand people where you want to try to change what the, how they work and uh, how they deliver value. And arguably what you can do in a couple of days for the small startup might take days, years, months for the, for the large organizations. I've worked for Trifork, I've worked for a company called Kona, a digital agency, and right now I am independent. While I worked at Triforg, I had a chance to write uh, a couple of mini books, uh, Priming Kanban and Real Life Scrum. They're both available for free download at, uh, at InfoQ, should you be interested. When I started with these things back in uh, 2006, it was all about Scrum. So basically, you just had to be Scrum Master, Product Owner, Certified Scrum Practitioner, and you were off to go. And uh, just remember that in my case, this proves that I've been able to sit in a room for two times two days and spend roughly half a day filling out a form on the internet. So uh, when people use these things, labels on their LinkedIn profiles, uh, it's your ability to actually take it out and use it in practice and create some results that matters. Uh, it's pretty easy to sit in a room for, for two days. I know there's a test now, but 99% passes, so uh, arguably that's not a good indicator either. Good. Good. Uh, being a bit nerdy about Agile and Lean, of course the teams and organizations I've worked with, we have big visual boards, try to coordinate stuff in the, with the least amount of effort necessary. Uh, again, being a bit more nerdy, of, of course I have my own personal bo board where I make sure that I'm not overloading myself with more stuff than I've proven to be able to finish. And being really nerdy about this, I thought it would be a great idea to take these principles back home uh, and to make sure that my better half at home does not overload me with more work than I've been proven to uh, be able to finish. And that's a brilliant idea for you guys out there. Just a question where you can ask, okay, so which idea do you want to remove from this bucket to be able to place your new great idea in there? Fantastic conversation during the weekend. <laughs> Good. In terms of the context for this talk, uh, though, arguably heavily inspired by Jeff Patton's work, I'm not going to deliver a description of story mapping as he perceived it. So this is my own version, this is how I've been working with it during the last six years. And what I've found to work, and arguably other people have found other stuff to work, uh, this is my version. Just roughly on the agenda, a bit about creating high quality waste, uh, overview about what story mapping is, just in short about getting started on the right foot, and then we'll dive into the actual details of it. I should notify you that you are guinea pigs, so once in a while you get to do a presentation for the first time, and uh, this is one of those times. So uh, if you have any feedback in terms of how it could be structured better, key points, things that you are missing, then argue, just use the GoTo app and, and tell me. I'll be happy to adjust it for the upcoming uh, versions of it. Just a quick rating. Uh, put your hands up if you consider yourself a novice. This is the first time you've ever heard of story mapping. Quite a lot of you. I can pretty much convince you of anything. Uh, informed, read a blog, other conference presentations. Put your hand up. Yeah. Practicing, you've tried it a few times. Okay, quite a few. Master, you may even have facilitated a couple of times. Down to a couple of hands now. You should actually be teaching or pre presenting right now. Ah, oh, that would have been easy. <laughs> Could have just switched. Okay. Just so, so you don't start by getting it all wrong, the context of this talk is trying to bring a new product to market, trying to do a new project, uh, or you're working on products or projects that are undergone there are undergoing heavy development. So we're not talking about support and maintenance things here. Uh, it probably, it might make sense, I haven't tried it, but uh, just to get up on the right foot. First, I'd like to talk a bit about what's often done wrong, at least in my perception, when we're doing Agile. So often, when I visit organizations, we have teams that have turned into what I call story point machines. 
So this is when people are starting to pay much more attention in terms of how much is coming out, in terms of what is the actual effect, why are we doing this. So everybody is running around, my team is so stable, we can do this many story points. Uh, we have a predictability that's within plus minus 20% over a three months horizon or whatever. And nobody cares about what's coming out of that machine. And I want to change that because this is not why we're here. We're not here to produce stuff, we're here to produce effects. And this is also where I think that story mapping is a great tool to, to at least get started on going down the right track. <coughs> Any of you have experience with these long fragmented lists of great ideas? This is what backlogs in real organizations often turn into. Everybody in the organization has tons of ideas and since somebody told us that we have to have backlogs to contain them, they're just all thrown in there. And then you try to find out what, what is the most important one, you put it on the top, and uh, sometimes it makes sense, and a lot of times it doesn't. It's just features, it's just stuff in there. And then this great agile coach came along, and he told you, all you have to do is just apply a score. So rate your things in terms of business value on a score from one to five, and assign an effort estimate, and out of this Excel sheet comes a prioritized list that you can work from. Great idea, and my God, agile, this agile coaching stuff becomes an easy task to do, right? This is actually what I used to do 10 years ago, so I'm partly to blame for, for this mindset. I didn't know any better at that time, so you're excused. And then there's the thought that if we just do enough iterations, by magic we'll arrive at the right place. We do not even have to know where we're going because just iterating, inspecting, adapting will find something that makes sense. That's simply not true. Sorry, you can iterate as much as you want. If it's without a direction, it's not guaranteed to get you anywhere good. Have you ever tried looking back six months from your, for your brilliant product or your project and just thought about what have we really achieved in these six months? And if your only answer is, we've developed all these features, then probably need to go a step back and think about what did we actually achieve? Why did we implement all these features? Back from the talk from Gabrielle and her team, we've done all this, we've celebrated that we fixed these 196 bugs and we implemented these 27 new features, but what did we achieve by doing this? Agile without direction is just iterating yourself to death. We can celebrate doing that, by all means. It's great to finish a lot of stuff, right? We can move post-its on a wall, and it's a good feeling moving something to done. Let's not say it's not. But it's not gonna get us, necessarily gonna get us anywhere in terms of our business. So really we're back to our good old friend Sun Tzu. Tactics without strategy is just the noise before defeat. And don't get me wrong, backlogs are great. They're just not great for strategy and high-level planning. They're good for daily groomings, they're good for keeping in check what we're working on, making sure that we are actually not trying to groom or place in detail a hundred user stories at the same time, but therefore the daily coordination stuff. They're not good for planning, they're not good for strategy, they're not good for talking about where we want to go as a business and why we're even building this product in the first place. So. If you take one thing away from today, I hope it's this. Prioritization is not about what you can do to fulfill a business need. It's about what you should do to create a desired effect. There's a big difference between those two. So back in 2008, I was struggling. I've had quite a lot of success building agile teams, quite a lot of success making sure that we could have a self-organizing team, product owners, scrum masters put in place, even some first-hand knowledge with Kanban. Again, the production machine was starting to work, but I couldn't really get a grasp of how do we turn this into something that's overall giving us the desired effect we want as a business. We can get a lot of stuff out there, but often it's without an overall direction. We're not able to measure where we're going. We're not in, it, nobody can really tell us if we're a success or not. And from an agile perspective, that's a problem because that's really the only thing you're trying to do. All the rest is just means to an end. So I read Jeff Patton's blog and I thought, this is great. This provides a nice framework for talking about what real users want 
and take an outside in perspective on agile development instead of just talking about this prioritized list of features. And then it has a nice title as well. It's called the new backlog is a map. That sounds nice. Sounds refreshing. And I had some chance to try it out back in 2008 and it actually worked really, really well. And before we dive into the details, I'd just like to give you guys a quick overview in terms of what story mapping is, just in short. So basically what we do is that we find a vision. Why are we here? What are we trying to build? You can use any format you like. I prefer this one where you write it in, in this structure, but basically it doesn't matter. Find out where we want to go. For this specific project, the example is, is a telecom company. They found out that a lot of people are running around with business mobiles paid by the company, but they run out of data on the vacation and they want to top off data with their own personal credit card. And it turns out to be an incredibly complicated process because otherwise you have to, uh, you have to engage with internal IT. It's really hard just to get a, the permission to have an extra gigabyte of data on your, on your vacation. They want to explore that opportunity, see if they can sell more data by, by doing this. What you do is then you identify your backbone. So your back backbone is simply put just the touch points, the, the themes that your customers or users go through from engaging with the product for the first time and until they use they are at the, their life cycle end. Once you've mapped your overall themes, your overall story, backbone, you find out who are we going to support in here? What are our main targets? Who are we interfacing with? What, what is our most important set of users that we want to prioritize when building this product? And when we're done with that, we walk these people through our themes. And we talk about what do you do in this? What are you getting out of this? What are you, fr from a user perspective, actually going to get out of using this product? And that turns into a lot of stuff. A lot of business needs that we can choose to fulfill, that we can choose to spend time and energy working on, or we can choose not to. And probably not all of them are equally good. And that's why we start to prioritize. And this is a physical exercise going on on a real whiteboard where we start to move things up and down. And for, for now, we're just trying to find out what is the most important thing to deliver. And then once we start to find out what the most important stuff to deliver is, it seems that a sort of a goal is starting to form. And this, this is an iterative process. As we find out what the most important things are for our end users, then we get more information in terms of establishing our goal. And when once we've established our goal, we find out we might need more while other things have become less relevant. This is just to kick off the discussion about where are we trying to go. But at the end, we should end up with a strategy stating the most important thing right now is to deliver on these business needs. We're deferring the solution to these business needs, but we want to fulfill these business needs from an end user point. And we're going to measure our success in this way. How will we actually measure our success? And I'll go into the details in a minute about this. But this was just to give you a framework for understanding the rest of the talk. Sometimes it's difficult if you start just by the individual steps and you don't really know where this is uh, going for 30 minutes until it all wraps up in the end. And at the end, we have what we in story mapping terms call a walking skeleton. So many people relate to the term minimum viable product, uh, minimum what was it we used in the last talk? Meaning lovable product uh, is also a term I've come across lately. There are, in terms of story mapping, some important aspects in terms of getting started on the right foot. When you're doing this exercise, you need to include the right people. I don't know who the right people are going to be in your specific situation. But make sure that you have the different stakeholders there because people are going to come from this, uh, to this from different perspectives. And... For example, people that have been sitting in support, listening to real users complaining about the existing services, can be a great source of inspiration when you're trying to plan something new. End users are, of course, also important, but maybe it's even a very good idea to uh, include your CEO if he's going to overrule your decisions anyway if he's, if he's not present. So make sure that you find out that in your, within your given context, who are your key stakeholders, who can provide the most valuable information in terms of laying out the strategy for what you're going to build next. It will differ a lot from product to product. Research is not bad. Sorry to say. So many people now argue, we're starting with Agile. This Agile stuff, we're just building something. We're testing it on real users, and they're going to put the thumbs up and down, and that is going to decide how we go further. 
research is not bad. It's just the, the amount of research that should be fitted to the domain we're trying to work within. But understanding the organization, understanding user segments, doing some market ana analysis, trying to map up your customer journey, that's a good thing because it makes you understand what you're trying to engage with and it makes it possible for you to define a better strategy going forward. That doesn't mean we should dive into the individual details at that point and trying to define what specific feature or what specific solution should we build to fulfill this business need. It's not at that level. But overall, investing a week, two weeks, three weeks, trying to lay out the strategy for the things that you're going to put potentially millions of kroners into over the next uh, half a year or a year, that's a good thing. And before you go into a session where you're invi inviting a lot of people that are going to spend your time in this session, write down, just on, on index cards, the already known business needs. You haven't decided whether you're going to execute these in a way, so it's just a title for now. But it's just a source of inspiration. And if you already know that you're going to prioritize these anyway, or if you're going to work or potentially prioritize them anyway, then just put them down on an index card before the session, because then you don't have to spend eight people's time writing things down on an index card. So it's just to get started on the right foot. Good. So let's talk about what story mapping really is what we, once we get down to the details. How many people in here have a written vision for the product or project you're working right now that potentially everybody engaging in this, being part of this, can explain in 20 seconds in the, in the elevator? About a tenth. Maybe it's because the rest of you are not working in the product or project space, so you're, you're excused. But it also could be the fact that often people simply do not realize where they're going. Again, it's a bunch of features, it's a list, and those lists can very, very turn into occupying all the mental space you have and all the capacity. So all you're focusing on is, again, these fragmented lists of ideas. So visions are important. This is telling you overall where do we want to go. Again, I like this format. There's lots of other formats out there. You can use vision canvases, there's lean canvas, Roman Pickler's got one as well. Uh, but try to find a form that accurately frames where are you and where you're going to go. And why are you doing this in the first place? If there's already a competitor out there that's launched something that you're never going to compete with, why, are you, why do you think you can provide a better service? Oh, it's because I'm already the owner of this giant silicon company, so we don't need to be the best because we can just push this onto customers anyway. That's fine. That's just what's main, going to make your product uh, the main differentiator. So reasons can be many, but just make sure that there's actually an argument for starting this in the first place. And then my personal opinion is that customer journeys rock in terms of understanding where you're going. This is not a session on customer journeys, so I'm not going to dive into the details, but basically a customer journey mapping session forces you to do an outside-in perspective on your situation. How are users interfacing with what you're trying to build? What are the main themes they're going to? What are the main touch points they're touching your product? In? This is going to tell us a lot about where do we want to put our energy? Are there touch points right there that we're not even focusing on right now? Touch points where people are just left to themselves? Could be. Could be we're supporting all of them, but we're only supporting them in a mediocre way. This is going to be a very valuable once we, try, when, once we want to start to try to prioritize anything. Because if, again, if we're just prioritizing from a one-dimensional list, it's a very, very hard thing to have a discussion about. So what we do when we story map is that we do this upfront research. Again, it's not non-agile to do some research. It's just that we don't want this to turn into a three-month analysis session. But spending a week or two is fine. And from this, we can start to evaluate what are we actually working with here? What are the main themes that users are going through? And basically, it's just putting them up on a wall or a whiteboard or whatever. And it doesn't even have to be accurate because we can change them during a session. It's just a post-it or some whiteboard marker ink up there. So if you find out on the, while we're doing the session that we want to describe something in a different way, we can just change it. But we can start to have a conversation about what we're trying to support. And this is going to tell us something about where we're putting our energy. And this is a key in terms of also just alignment in an organizational perspective. So if you're bringing multiple stakeholders in there, chances are they're not going to agree. And the goal is not necessarily to get everybody to agree, but we want an alignment to occur early on so that we're not going to have a constant fight in terms of direction going weeks and months into the project. 
because again, I'm sure you've all discovered that changing direction, like big direction, every two weeks is not going to get you into a good space. So it's, it's about alignment. It's about focusing on where do we want to put our energy. Another example, so we can easily tell from just this picture. Right now we've prioritized what's up here for our minimal viable product, our walking skeleton, whatever we want to call it. And immediately we can see that we're leaving some touch points untouched. Could be that we're very brave in this situation, that we're going to launch a product without being able to build our customers. That's our decision. We want to get to market quickly. We want to get some feedback early. So we've all agreed that billing is actually not a priority for the first version. I've had several customers using that strategy. It's fine if you, that you can get something out. If you're, not, if you're billing on a monthly cycle and you're giving away the first month for free anyway, then you can defer that month because you can still onboard your customers. You can still get the feedback before you implement the functionality to actually build them. That's fine. And this is just telling us what, what decisions have we made. So it's not the point that we're going to follow this as a strict plan and implement all this stuff in, the, in this order, but it's about having a conversation about where do we want to put our energy? Where do we think we're going to achieve the biggest benefit and business effect? So once you've decided on your touch points, how you're going to map, then you need to focus on who are you going to do this for? And it's quite crucial. I had, I've, I've had previously uh, the chance to work with organizations where a stakeholder analysis included the word can. Who can possibly be affected? It's like saying, we want everybody to have an opinion about what we're going to build. And imagine your life as a product owner, if you have to include every single person's opinion going forward. That's necess not necessarily a good strategy. So you really have to focus. Because if you're going to interface with 25 different user segments every time you do a release and try to get feedback based on that, you're going to spend all your time trying to get feedback and you probably have no time left actually using that feedback for anything relevant. So prioritization, once we talk about user groups, user needs, that's a key thing. And you should not try to please everybody. It's fine that by focusing on your main user segments or target groups, that you're going to please somebody else. But be very, very clear in terms of your strategy. Who are our most valuable assets here? Who are we going to get the biggest benefit out of pleasing in the first place? Because you cannot please any everybody, and trying to do so will probably just make sure that you're not pleasing anybody at all. Great. So once we're at that point, we're going to start to just throw the cards that we've written down beforehand on the wall. And the basic rule is just, that's usually what I do, just put them in a pile or just spread them out over a table and just ask anyone to just grab any card and put it in the touch point where you think it makes sense. Just a totally messy exercise where we're just trying to get things up there. And things are moved around and people are arguing whether it should be in that point, a touch point or not. We're just trying to have a conversation about using and trying to get things up there. And then the crucial point is that we start to walk the map, as it's called. So this is where we are starting to tell real stories about real users. What are we actually going to do in each touch point for these guys? How are we going to fulfill your business need by doing this specific thing? What user need are we going to work on here? And this is where we're telling our stories from an outside-in perspective, walking each user segment through our map, talking about how are you going to benefit from what, in what touch point? And this is a great exercise, and this is where you will find out how much people really disagree about something. We're not even starting the prioritization yet. We're just talking about users and how we can generate some effect that's going to benefit them and us in the long run. And we do it one target group at the time. And this is a guy called Henrik. And uh, he's really engaged. He's a former user experience designer, and now he's turned into more of a business development role. And at this point, this is right before he gets really disappointed. Because at this point, he's really engaged, and he's talking about how he's going to please these users all the way through, and how this is going to be a great thing, until Michael, who's sitting right here, is going to tell him in about two minutes that he thinks he's got it all wrong. But this is great, because this is creating early alignment, because we're talking about real users engaging and we're talking about it from a user perspective. And we're not talking about how we're going to implement this specific business need yet. 
And that's an important thing. It's all this agile stuff gets so easy if you just have the, com the, c the comfort to defer solutions to specific problems. We have great user experience designers. We have great technical teams. We have great graphical designers that can find perfectly accurate solutions to business problems. You don't need to worry about all that stuff up front. All you need to do is focus on where do we want to put our energy to create the largest business effect. How you're going to implement that, you can de defer that solution to later. And of course, if you're working in a waterfall environment, you can use exactly the same strategy, just instead of dying, then starting to try to build something, you'll just write it all down in the large requirement spec afterwards. Same thing works. You'll still f get the chance to focus on the essentials, and you'll still get the chance to talk about what really matters. You'll just do a very boring pro process afterwards. Good. And it's essential to keep this talk about an end user perspective. And it's really hard in reality because really quickly we're diving down into features. Really quickly I'm starting to talk about specific solutions to stuff. And constantly when I'm facilitating these sessions, I have to ha ask people to take a step back and say, it's good and fine, we're going to have that discussion at some point in time, but this is not the time because we're not even aligned on the high level yet. We've not even decided what overall business needs we want to focus on. And right now you're jumping into a solution mode. We can do that later. We'll have plenty of time for that. And no doubt, we have to turn this into working functionality at some point if we have to have the chance to generate some business outcome. But we don't need to do that in right now. And then the whole processation exercise starts. And at some point, we start to draw some lines across this whiteboard or wall or whatever. And whatever goes above that line is included in the very first version. And whatever is below that line is not. And we can draw several lines here if we want to do release planning one and a half years from now. Probably not the most beneficial way to use your time, but you're free to do that. But anyway, the really good discussion is about how little do we actually have to build to get the next release to market. And that's an important discussion because whenever you take something from here and put it up here, you're going to invest more time, more budget, and you're going to add more complexity. And that's the kind of discussion you want to have. And that's especially relevant if you're a small startup like these guys. And this is uh, a girl called Camilla. They're building what they called Spotify for students so that you have access to your books and material through a subscription fee instead of actually buying the books. That's the product they're trying to build. And originally th th she thought that for the first version she wanted everything. Like any startup owner would think, right? And she could just see very clearly that for each ticket, she would take from this line and put it above the other. She would be adding complexity, she would be adding budget, she would need to get more funding. And that's a very great exercise, and that's a very good conversation to have. And it really, really, really reveals how easy it is to start to just build more innovation into a product that is truly necessary. And again, keeping it physical is absolutely crucial. At some point, we have to start doing the hard stuff. So until now, it's easy. Yes, we had some alignment problems. Yes, people didn't agree. Yes, the CEO decided to make a decision that everybody disagreed with, but he, he was the CEO, so he was entitled to do that. But at some point, we have to start discussing release goals and actual KPIs. So that is what we discussed in Gabby's session on the Mobius loop. What business effect are we trying to achieve here? And that's not easy. And people argue that multiple factors will inf influence the KPIs we're trying to measure. But it's much more dangerous to ignore this and just continue in some ungiven direction than this to actually try to do this and get it wrong. So try to get it as close as you possibly can. And yes, you're not going to be the only thing in the entire world that's going to affect the success of your product. Yes, you're going to have marketing campaigns that's also going to generate some activity on your site. Yes. Maybe you should include them, maybe you shouldn't, depends on your context. But you need to have this discussion and you need to put it down. I love this quote from Dan Ranas in The Principles of Product Development Flow. Basically it just states, one of the most dangerous of all batch size problems is the tendency to pack more innovation into a single project than is truly necessary. Remember that. That's what we're all doing and we're doing it all the time, because we're so afraid that we're not going to get a second chance to prioritize anything. But what is the real risk here? 
it's probably not the chance that we're not going to be asked again. But if we're looking at Amazon, when they're doing their data mining, it turns out that 60 to 90% of what they're putting out there is removed again because it does not optimize the metric they thought it would. And arguably, yes, Amazon is experimenting more than the average company, but arguably they're not the least mature in terms of establishing those experiments. They're actually a quite mature agile organizations. And if they get 60 to 90% wrong, I'm assuming that the rest of us are not doing a whole lot better. And I can't remember the exact figures, but it's something like 80% of all cost in IT is maintaining features after they're deployed. It's not actually building them. So again, what risk are we trying to address? It's not a budget, it's not only a budget time and scope risk. It's also a business effect risk, and we tend to ignore that. So when you're doing this, when you're starting to move too much above that very visible physical line on your board, just remember that if you're adding 50% in scope, you're adding complexity by at least 50%. I'm guessing these are very pessimistic numbers, actually. At least 50% effort, at least 50% budget, and at least 50% time. And often, the only reason why you're doing this is your culture and your budgeting cycles. And they might be valid excuses because you're not going to be asked in another year again, so you really only get this one chance. But think hard about how you can change that mindset because you're really optimizing for addressing the wrong risk. So these are difficult but important questions to ask yourself. Do we truly need to deliver all that to reach the release goal we've set up? Could we afford to defer something like billing to the next cycle? Because really we do not need it yet. Do we really need to be able to mine all the data at this point or can we defer that decision to later? What are the core release goals we're trying to deliver on? And even harder, but even more important, how are we going to measure whether we're a success or not? And it's going to take time and effort, and that's what's typically disregarded. Numbers, they don't just come out of anything. They come out of putting real effort into finding out where is our baseline right now, how are we going to measure if we're improving or not, how are we going to follow up on that data and actually make real decisions based on, based on that decision. So ask yourself, what will we do if numbers do not match? Because when you're sitting in these situations, I'll guarantee you that you're all going to think, yeah, we're going to do better than that. We're going to beat those numbers. It's going to be great. And then it turns out that you're really not. I remember releasing a feature once where we had set up a number that it should increase engagement by at least 10%, and we wanted to see at least 2,000 clicks on that feature every day for these 5,000 users. And at the end of the first week, we had 20 clicks. <laughs> People had celebrated that we launched this feature, but the celebration in terms of the business effect achieved was, let's just say, mediocre. Are we, but what are we going to do in that situation? Are we just going to ignore it? Because at least metrics are just, they're just nice if they show the right thing, right? And when they, it turns out that metrics are wrong, then we'd rather ignore them. But if we're not going to make any decisions based on this anyway, if you're not going to change your attitude, then you can forget about measuring anything. And I'm sorry, I know that there's a lot of agile coaches out there telling you all you need to do is just measure the smile on your customer's face. That sounds great, doesn't it? Just put out the ruler and you can measure the amount of success. I'd like us to set the bar a bit lower, so or a bit higher. So if we're a consultant, yeah, <laughs> that came out really wrong, right? <laughs> They shouldn't be happy. They should just pay the bills. That could be a way of setting the bar lower. <laughs> I'd actually like us to talk about how can we generate successful customers. And there's a difference because, don't get me wrong, it's not that easy to please customers, but it's not that hard either. You can actually come out as a consultant company delivering some crap piece of software that works exactly like the customers want and they'll be happy, and they'll give you a 10 out of 10 on every single score you can throw at them. But that doesn't mean that they're successful. And I'd like us to set the bar higher and state, we're not just talking about making you guys happy. We're not just talking about your willingness to spend more money in the short term. We're talking about making you successful enough, enough so that as a consultant company, we can engage with you on the long term as well. And there is a different difference. 
So basically, feel free to be as creative as you want, but keep it visual. So uh, however you want to approach this, I would really, really recommend that you do not throw this into an electronic tool. Because having the physical exercise of moving, taking a ticket and moving it with your hands on top of some line, acknowledging that this is going to increase the budget, time, scope, whatever, that's a very good exercise. And it's a lot easier to have conversation about a physical thing on a board than it is an electronic tool. And you can really get away with very, very simple tools. So in this particular session, all we had was just a wall and a number of post-its. We didn't have any tape, and just by having some different color post-its, you can create a story map looking like this. So instead of drawing a line, we just used the pink post-its, folded, the, folded them, and that is now our line. So if you're on top of this pink line here, you're in the first version. You can use a door. If that's the uh, only free space you've got, these specific guys are using, as you can see, the lean canvas approach to defining their vision. Also a great way of communicating where you want to go. In general, glass walls are really great because typically, at least, you can erase whatever you choose to, to write on those glass walls. Even a dinner table can do. So it can really be very low tech. One thing to remember, it's just the direction. With the knowledge you've got right now, it's just that direction. At least if you're working in an agile context. If you're working in a more traditional context, it's the plan you're going to follow no matter the input you get from there on onwards. My rule of thumb is that if you find yourself in a domain where you know a lot about your customers, maybe you've even built a product like this before, maybe you're just extending an, an existing solution, then even in that situation, you're only going to get it 80% right in terms of the best things to focus on. And things will change once, you're, once you start going. If you choose to dive a little deeper, and actually that's sometimes a good idea, also in terms of communication, because just showing that you're heading in a specific direction, even though you're changing that underway, will sometimes calm an organization down. CEOs, stakeholders, people with budgets, planning, they will just be calmed by down by the fact that there's a roadmap. Whether you choose to follow it or not, whether it changes after the first, at least long, as long as you've got good reasons to do those changes, they're fine with that, but it will just calm them down and they'll stop screaming for waterfall plans going one and a half years into the future just by showing that there's actually a roadmap laid out in terms of how you want to approach this. So 80% for the things that you're going to do as the very, very first things, 50% for what you're planning in release two, and of course, if you're using continuous deployment, there's nothing keeping you from not releasing these one at a time. So it's more a communication aspect than there's a release planning aspect. And once you get beyond the first two concepts here, the first two release goals, then you're probably down to 30% of this ever becoming something that you're going to prioritize and put energy and effort into, because you're going to learn so much from these first, from the feedback from the first two here, that Whatever you thought was the most important thing is almost gar by guarantee not going to be it once you're three, four months into the future. And again, keep it physical, a really important aspect, and update it. So what I typically do is that uh, when we start the first session, we're already there going to book the following sessions. And whether it's something you do once a month or something you do once every three months, that's totally up to you. Usually my experience is that doing it more than once a month, it just doesn't work. It's high level planning. It's not trying to plan the details of what you're going to try to do uh, in the next sprint or in the next iteration. It's high level planning. So doing it more than once a month typically just doesn't work. People just show up and not enough have changed and you just feel like you're wasting your time. Doing it more than three months apart, it also starts to gen have, it have the effect that too much have happened. So you're not, sim you're not feeling that this is a live, ongoing thing if you're doing it once in every half a year. The feedback loop is simply too slow. So s my experience is that having a story mapping session where you plan, where you do the high-level planning, somewhere between one and three months apart, that typically works very well. And I'll have to acknowledge that sometimes it's not so important that you use the exact structure I've showed you right here. 
it's really about getting it onto a wall and having a two-dimensional thing to work at. So I remember, and that's probably that's probably more than six years back, probably seven, where we had a product that was split into two software teams working on very different kinds of software, a hardware team and a sales team. And you could argue that's not a cross-function team and all that stuff, but that was the situation we found ourselves in. But we used, a we used a story map kind of structure to just divide into those four aspects of what we were trying to deliver. And just mapping that onto a board and having the two-dimensional board to work on made it a lot easier to align these four teams against each other. It was not story mapping in the sense that I've presented to you right now, but just getting it on a wall and not keeping it as a one-dimensional list will often, often help just by itself. Good. So at least to me, and uh, tell me I'm wrong if you feel so, uh, but to me, story mapping has for the last five, six years provided a way to focus on the essentials. And that's by far the most important thing. It really, story mapping is essentially just a way of capturing the conversations you've had about your users, about your product, about what you're trying to do. And it's about aligning stakeholders. So typically, you can just get, you're, you're already 10 steps ahead. If you leave that room and people disagreed, and they might still disagree, but at least now they're aligned and they agree on that. This, this is what we've tried, to, this is what we decided to focus on. And you'll just get rid of all the noise and all the political discussions and all the stuff that was just, I was not included and stuff like that. And you can go forward from then, deliver on what you thought were your hypothesis in terms of what was going to generate business value. It might turn out that you were wrong and you can do another role if it turns out that you should go in a different direction. How many of you can answer the simple questions? What are you building for whom and why? Come on, must be more. <laughs> okay, that seems like two thirds of you. That's a good thing. That's not a given in all organizations, sadly. I've been in a lot of organizations where the first thing I asked was this simple question and people were like, I'm building a feature. Yes, who are you building it for? I don't know, but I was told to build it. Okay, why are you building it? What is it going to do? I'm guessing that people have some use for it. What? <laughs> and that is the situation, especially in large organizations. You have hundreds of people sitting there developing software to users they've ever, ever never met. You've not seen them use the software a single time. I remember back many years ago where we were building a system and uh, we simply couldn't find out why people thought this was not an intuitive user interface until we found out that all the users, like the super users we were working closely with, they had 23-inch screens. But all the other in the company, they had 19-inch screens. And yes, arguably that was not a very intuitive user interface once you got to see how it worked on a 19-inch screen. But that was not the kind of uh, knowledge we had at that point. I remember another case where we couldn't find out why people got confused when handling a lot of cases. And to us, a lot of ca uh, cases hand being handled at the same time was between three and seven. And then when we got out to the real users, we found out that they were sitting with something like 25 or 50. And our user interface was in no way designed to support that kind of structure. So again, just getting it out into real users and having that, those close conversations would get you a, a long way. Okay, so uh, some basic takeaways. And I'm not going to go through and read all those, but hopefully that was some of the things you got out of this, uh, this session. Uh, it's more so that when you get the slides, you can just browse directly to that slide if you just want to, to have the capture. And then uh, we have some, uh, some time for, for questions. Before we get that far, I'd like to brag a lot. And uh, the reason why I would like to do that is that uh, on the 15th of October, then I'm leaving for a six and a half month trip around the world with my family. So uh, have a nice winter, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the end here, I've got some, uh, some contact information as well. So you'll get uh, that through the slides. And uh, that was it in terms of the presentation. And uh, since I am the track host, then I just need to find out the question you've asked in the on the track host page myself. Let's see. There we are. Okay, so I'll pick the question that is easiest to answer for me. <laughs> okay, so one good question actually. Should the story map be visual? 
slash accessible in between sessions. So definitely. So if you've got the chance to just put this on the wall where the people working with the product is, just keep it on the wall and keep it in the team room. It's a great way to have the continuous discussion, keep your vision highlighted at all times and that you continue talking about what you're trying to do for real users. In real life, not all people are in that space. And what happens, I hate to, uh, I have to admit, is that they end up in a backlog. So basically what you do is that you take what you've prioritized for the first release, you discuss what is the most key thing to deliver right now on in terms of technical risk, business risk, uh, what you're trying to do, and then you start implementing that. And then once you've changed direction a bit, you might update your story map or you might not, uh, but then one or three months later you do a second roll and that turns into another set of prioritized backlog items. So that is what typically happens in real life. Uh, I've worked with companies that stuck to the story map as a backlog as well. Uh, that worked kind of okay, but they had to make some trade-offs in terms of vision. Prioritization is not as clear when you're using story map. So you have to put numbers on the individual tickets because it's like a slice and you cannot see which is the highest if you do it uh, all the way through. So it's a trade-off, but I would say 85% of the time, it ends up in a traditional backlog anyway. And I'm fine with that. It's for high level planning and it's for laying out your strategy to so making sure that you focus on the right KPIs. Okay, so another one. How much do you prepare before the story map workshop? And uh, that differs a lot. I have a mindset of maximum four weeks of work. So if you cannot batch it into a four to four weeks maximum, then go back and rethink whether you could do something in a more effective way, whether you really need to engage with 15 different users and interview them all, or whether you could get 80% of the information by just talking to five of them or seven of them. So uh, working in a digital agency as I did with Kona, that's a really hard job because you, the room is like filled with people where all they want to do sometimes is just do a lot of research. So trying to get them into the mindset of doing just enough to get started and trying to start to validate some of your hypothesis and assumption and the fact that it's actually an, a hypothesis and an assumption and it's not just going to turn into real business value just because you, you thought you were a great user experience designer. That's a hard thing to, to do. So there's no answer in terms of that, but I would say between one and four weeks and I'd like to keep it shorter rather than longer. Okay. Uh, Another question reads, all touch points. And that's actually a very good question because if you look at how users interface with a company as a whole, then there will be lots and lots and lots of touch points if you look across the entire user journey. So building a product, what you often end up doing is saying, okay, we're going to focus on this part of the customer journey and we're going to elaborate on the touch points that that's within this specific segment, because that is where our product has market value, that is where we're going to achieve some business benefit. So you do not necessarily have to cover the ex entire company's user journey and how users f interface with companies uh, in all touch points to do an effective story mapping. All that would leave you with is maybe 25 touch points and you'll conclude before you even get started that you're just going to use the 10, the 10 uh, touch points in the middle anyway. So that's a lot of wasted wall space that you could probably use for, for something else. Okay. You talk about products, but we talk about projects, epics and stories. Can we employ the same techniques at those levels? So basically, and again, this is where words pr often get people uh, confused. To me, what we're putting in those touch points is basically just agile epics. It's just high-level descriptions of business need that we have, to that we want to fulfill, but we've, where we've yet deferred the solution to that specific business need. And that is at least how I interpret an epic. And I know that there are probably as many definitions of an epic as there are people in the, in this room. So it's a different, it's a difficult conversation to have. But this maps directly into how I've not always been doing Agile, but at least how I perceive to be an effective way of doing Agile right now, where what, where what we can do is that we can prioritize a set of high-level epics, and then once we get closer to actually wanting to spend time and energy on those, we can break them into, into user stories, 
and then should the team want to, they can break it into some task, but we really do not care because that is just their way of coordinating their work. It's not something we want to spend time estimating, time uh, coordinating, uh, stuff like that. So that is just uh, the basics. Of it. Let's take some questions. And all I can say is that it works better if you're all physically present. And yes, have we had people joining through a laptop where we've seen them on a Skype connection and they've just used the webcam to see the board? Yes, we have. Did it work? Yes, it worked. Did it work as good as it would have had if they had been in the room with the rest? No. Yeah. Uh, again, I've tried it, but I must also admit that the only tool I've tried it in was Rally and my without bashing rally too much, it really did not fulfill what we needed to do an online, real-time story mapping session. It, the tool simply couldn't support the, the things going on. So it turned out to be quite, quite a frust frustrating exercise, and I'm not sure we, ach we achieved something really valuable during that uh, session because it became very much a tool problem session and less of a prioritization and business direction session. Okay, we're out of time, so uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, remember to rate the session in the GoTo app, and I'll stay up here if some of you have more questions and uh, would like to have a discussion with them.